the Canadian Aviation Historical Society. And with that, I will turn it over to Hugh for tonight's introduction. Yes, I, I specifically asked to be able to introduce Carl Vincent. Actually, I want to make a, a point that Carl and Elizabeth, they're uh, quite a team. Uh, you get uh, two for one practically every time you encounter them. Uh, you go to the archives, they're there together. I just wanted to say particularly about Carl, though. He's an interesting cat. He's been an author. He's been a publisher. Uh, he produced uh, probably the first book about the uh, the Avro, and that was about forty. Uh, the Arrow, that was about forty years ago. He's done this uh, book on the fortress and uh, liberator in Canadian service. But I wanted in particular to pay tribute to Carl because forty odd years ago, he wrote and he produced a book, which I would recommend to anybody as a model of truly truly good research and magnificent writing and when I read it, I, it was one of the saddest books I've ever read. <clears throat> it was called No Reason Why and it was about the Hong Kong disaster. And I think how, however flippant Carl may be, remember that he wrote the best book ever on the Hong Kong disaster. Over to you Carl. Good evening to you. Now, it's normal on these occasions to start with an apology for what you're about to say. So, of course, I will follow suit. When Hugh asked me to do something, I thought, oh, we got these hundreds, no, literally hundreds of photographs of early aviation in Newfoundland, particularly the transatlantic attempts and so forth, to do a little talk, linking them together. Gee, that's going to be easy. And it was. And then I said, well, gee, I'm a Newfoundlander, you know. The country's got to play some part in this. It's not just a takeoff of a destination. So I got into that and the movement of the shaking and all the rest of that. But then I saw, if I include that, along with the pictures and the narrative, we'll be here until midnight. Now, that will be pleasant, depending on whom you're with right now. But, uh, so, I, I'm afraid at the end I did condensing, cutting, and so forth. The flying bits are all there, but most of the other stuff I have had to either drastically compress, dilute, or delete. So, consider this, that my apology for the scrappiness of the presentation, especially the latter part of it. Okay. That's where that thing cool. Even for, before the beginning of World War I, when aviation was a little more than a decade old, some tentative thoughts were being given to transoceanic flights. Despite the primitive aircraft of the day, the English Channel, the North Sea, and other bodies of water had been overflown. So, why not the Atlantic? This aspiration was affirmed when the British newspaper magnate Nord, Lord Northcliffe on 1st of April 1913 offered a £10,000 prize for the first to fly from a point in North America to one in Europe. It's probably not significant that Northcliffe had substantial paper manufacturing and forestry holdings in Newfoundland. Or maybe it is. We all know the extraordinary stimulation given to aviation by the war, which resulted in an enormous development of aircraft, motors, and even employment. The transatlantic flight appeared increasingly feasible, and even before the war ended in July 1918, the Northcliffe papers reaffirmed the prize offer. Therefore, it is no surprise that very few months after the armistice had been signed in November 1918, a number of contestants had lined up and were jockeying for a position. Taking the prevailing winds into account, a flight from west to east obviously had the best chance of success, 
It was equally obvious that a departure for some eastern location in the island of Newfoundland increased its possibility. There were four British teams contesting for the prize, all of which were sponsored to some degree or other by major aircraft firms. The first representative arrived in St. John's in February 1919, Charles Morgan representing the Martin, the Martin side team. On his arrival, he spent several frustrating days trudging through the snowdrift looking for a suitable flat area to permit takeoff, finally settling on a site near Kittivitty Lake near St. John's as being the least worse. He returned to England, returning in April not only with his pilot, Frederick Raynham, but the Martin side biplane, which they christened the uh, Raymore. They were soon joined by a rival team representing the Sopwith Company, consisting of pilot Harry Hawker and navigator Kenneth Mackenzie Greve, with, not unnaturally, a Sopwith biplane. Having been preempted for the Kitty Vitty site, they found a takeoff site near what is now Mount Pearl. By this time, Northcliffe had adroitly altered the rules to weigh the balance in favor of a British team collecting the money. Now, not only did the crossing have to be done non-stop, but the destination had to be either Great Britain or Ireland. The change was, at least in part, inspired for the fact there was another rival in the field. The United States, despite its proclaimed dedication to free enterprise, was now sponsoring a team with all of the massive resources of the United States Navy behind it. During the last part of the war, the USN had developed a requirement for a large flying boat that could be delivered overseas by air. This aircraft, the Curtis NC series, was just entering production in late 1918. Although it was realized that it would be ineligible for the prize, an attempt to fly the Atlantic was planned, uh, and I quote, for the prestige of the U.S. Navy. <laughs> the Enterprise was to depart from Trapassi on the south shore of the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland and to fly via the Azores to Lisbon, Portugal. In order to assure a safe arrival without navigation errors, brilliantly illuminated United States Navy destroyers were positioned at 50 miles intervals all the way across the Atlantic along the route. One of these aircraft, the NC-4, did finally complete the trip, taking 19 days to do so. As a parallel endeavor, a U.S. Navy blimp, the C-5, was also intending to make the attempt. It finally reached St. John's after suffering a number of mishaps and also getting lost a couple of times, but then it blew away in a gale. I think that was the first picture you saw there. The two British teams already in St. John's had made a gentleman's agreement to inform each other when one of them was about to embark on the flight. The American attempt so spooked them that Hawker and Mackenzie Grave took off in their shop with on the 18th of May in order to arrive in Britain before the NC boats reached Lisbon. Not to be outdone, Raynham and Morgan took off a few hours later in the hopes of overtaking and passing them in mid-air, but the heavily loaded Raymoor crashed on takeoff, though the crews arrived. The Sopwith failed to arrive in either Britain or Ireland, and the crew were given up for dead. They had been forced to ditch due to an overheating engine, and the vessel that rescued them in the end had no wireless, so their safe reappearance was a pleasant surprise. The ill fortune of these first two attempts left the way clear for two more British teams, each equipped with a late World War I bomber to have a try. On the 26th of May, Pilot John Alcock and navigator Arthur Whitten Brown, sponsored by Vickers, arrived with their Vimy bomber, finally finding a site in Leicester Field near St. John's and commenced to assemble the aircraft. At the same time, Admiral Mark Kerr and crew began to erect their e enormous Hanley Page V-1500 at Harvard Race, presumably because all suitable sites at St. John's were already taken up. Once again, there was an intense, though friendly, competition to prepare each aircraft for the flight. The handy pace suffered the worst delays, primarily due to engine cowling problems, cooling problems. Thus, although delayed for several days by apparent bad weather over the Atlantic, surprise, surprise, 
Alcock and Brown in the Bemi took off on 14 June 1919. Despite running into wicked weather, which caused all kinds of problems, after a flight of over 16 hours, they reached the coast of Ireland and made a spectacular, though not particularly successful, landing in the Bahamas. This was unquestionably the first successful non-stop crossing of the Atlantic, and Alcock and Brown not only were awarded the prize, but were also given a great deal of well-deserved publicity. With this success, the Handy Page team lost their incentive for a transatlantic attempt, and instead embarked on a tour of eastern North America, finally making a forced landing at Cleveland, at which point the tour was abandoned. Now, there was one more Atlantic crossing in 1919, and a doubly successful one at that. In July, the big British original R-34 crossed the Atlantic from east to west. It made landfall on the east coast of Newfoundland and dropped a package of letters to spectators in the Fortune Bay area before proceeding on to Long Island in the U.S. Only three days later, it departed and made a successful eastward crossing. This event, in which Newfoundland was only peripherally involved, was to be the last attempt to cross the ocean by air for several years. Now, it may be as well to take a brief look at Newfoundland at this time. Having rejected Confederation of the Canada a couple of times in the 19th century, it was now a self-governing dominion, despite a small population and a smaller economy. Now, immediately after World War I, it was coming to grip with the fact that the promise of the post-war era was compromised by the huge, the immense debt piled up by a railway and construction binge just before the war, and the equally tremendous costs, both financial and personal, of his participation in the First World War. Thus, while it took some time for this to sink in, any benefit that might be derived from participation in post-war aviation looked attractive. Furthermore, its independent status made some of its empire associates look at it with a jaundiced eye. There can be no denying that both Britain and Canada looked upon Newfoundland as some kind of a loose cannon and resented the fact that such a minor country should deign to play an independent role which might interfere with their own more important interests. One thing that distinguished Newfoundland was that it did not share the paranoia held by Canada and, to a lesser extent, by Britain about the United States. It was far more culturally and socially attuned to the U.S. than to Canada. The U.S. was a destination of choice for the huge majority of immigrants from Newfoundland, while closer economic ties with the U.S., which was Newfoundland's biggest, biggest <coughs> trading partner, was always a desideratum. One example was that in the 1890s, Newfoundland worked out a species of free trade agreement with the U.S., upon which Canada scampered squealing and tackling to Mother Britain and got it no. Even with the railway and the ferry to Canada at the end of the 1890s, to a large extent, Canada was something you crossed if you wanted to get to the U.S. by land. Politics in Newfoundland can be described as colorful and uh, uninhibited. Now, any Newfoundland historian can rightfully accuse me of gross oversimplification when I'm saying that uh, there are two main groups which uh, regularly charge to change their party names. Essentially, the Conservatives represented the main financial interests. In essence, the establishment which was reasonably satisfied with the way things were going, with their place in the scheme of things, and had no major incentives for adventure or gambles. The other crowd, which possibly could be designated as liberals, were more inclined to take financial risks and were continually on the lookout for new commercial activity and financing for the country. There were always various wild cards as cultured fishermen's party. Accusations of corruption and chicane were frequent and may, or may not, have been justified. It appeared that aviation might play a substantial role in Newfoundland immediately after the war. A major British aviation interest, Airco, later the Avalon, attempted to get some kind of an exclusive hammerlock on aviation in Newfoundland. And its eventual spearhead was an energetic airman and entrepreneur named Sidney Cotton, well known before then and even better known after. 
Well, for three years after the war, there was a considerable amount of aviation activity. It eventually came to Liquid. And as far as Cox was doing for concern, there's going to be a two-part article in CAH Journal, fairly soon, I hope, please God, uh, about his exploits. Well, the 1919 successes confirmed that an actual aerial crossing of the Atlantic was feasible. It also indicated that at that stage of aerial and mechanical technology, it was extremely hazardous. So for the next seven years, no direct crossing was made or even attempted. There was one indirect crossing, however, which involved Newfoundland and Labrador. This was once again undertaken by the indefatigable airmen, not with the United States Navy, but this time with the United States Army. In 1924, five specially constructed Douglas World Cruisers set out on a round trip, round world flight heavily supported and well prepared by American naval and diplomatic efforts. Many accidents and incidents occurred during the west to, east to west circuit, and by the time the aircraft reached Iceland, there was only two remaining. These two successfully landed and were resupplied at Ice Temple, Labrador, in Hawks Bay, Newfoundland on 31 August and 2nd September, uh, respectively. Uh, they eventually arrived at their starting point in Seattle on the 28th of September, six months after they had departed. Despite the lack of attempts at additional Atlantic crossings, this was not because there was no financial incentive. Not long after the successful Vimy crossing, the French hotel magnate, Raymond Ortega, offered a prize of $25,000 US, that's what it's on in these days, not that bad now, for the first non-stop flight between New York and Paris. This seemed to have been so far beyond the powers of current aeronautical technology that it was never attempted until 1926. By then, however, aspirants for the prize were starting to jockey for a position. A French team in 1926 and an American one in April 1927 both crashed on takeoff, resulting in deaths in both cases. This still left a number of hopeful contestants trying to beat each other to the coast. The next attempt was by French war pilot Nungesser and, Navi and navigator Coley, taking off from Paris on 8 May 1927, having decided on the far more hazardous passage from east to west in order to make it first. They disappeared somewhere over the Atlantic but it was felt that they probably had made substantial progress, and vague rumors had them seen or heard over or near Newfoundland. So an intensive but eventually unsuccessful search was instituted. One of the searchers was a stormy petrol of early Newfoundland aviation, Sidney Cotton, who somehow had financed a Fokker airplane named the Jean d'Arc, which he had shipped to St. John in order to participate, though, of course, without success. Of the three remaining American competitors, one crashed during the trial flight, while another had its attempt uh, stalled by an internal legal dispute. The remaining contestant, Charles Lindbergh, in his purpose-built Ryan monoplane, Spirit of St. Louis, took off on 20 May and eventually landed in Paris. Once again, Newfoundland was only peripherally involved uh, as Lindbergh, an experienced pilot and a consummate navigator, selected St. John's as an ideal navigation waypoint from which to commence its, uh, the actual Atlantic crossing. He flew low over the city and over the harbor, exiting through the narrows, and was seen there by numerous citizens. There is no doubt that even this brief appearance helped to confirm in the minds of many Newfoundlanders the country's potential significance in the field of transatlantic aviation. This opinion was reinforced by the arrival of Italian airman Francesco Di Pinedo, who, along with two crewmen, was touring the world in the Savoia Marchetti SM-55 flying boat. Overshadowed both by the concurrent New York to Paris race and his support of the, uh, by the uh, fascist government of Italy, Little attention was paid to it internationally, although not new from that. Having flown the South Atlantic to Brazil and working his way north through the United States, 
He arrived in Trapassi, Newfoundland, the same day Lindbergh took off on his trip flight to Paris. The Pinedo took, uh, took off three days later for the Azores, but was forced down short of his goal and had to be told the rest of the way. Long distance flying, inspired by Lindbergh's success, was now very much in the aviation forefront. Not long after, an attempt would be made that involved Newfoundland to a greater extent than ever before. Two Americans, Edward Slade and William Brock, both experienced aviators who had been involved together in the oil business in Detroit, were also associated with the Stinson Aircraft Corporation, also in that city, had determined to try for a record in circumnavigating the globe, the globe by air. This was to be done in a Stinson Detroit monoplane named, not unnaturally, the Pride of Detroit. They decided that the stop in Newfoundland would, on the whole, reduce the number of hours spent in the air between Europe and North America, presumably warned by the experience of previous flyers who had taken off from Newfoundland and who had spent an inordinate number of days flailing around in an attempt to find a suitable takeoff point. They dispatched, they dispatched an associate, Fred Kohler, to Newfoundland with instruction to find a suitable takeoff point and construct an air trip on it. The town of Harbor Grace in Conception Bay, Newfoundland, had found that its prosperity had drastically diminished in the latter part of the 19th century as more and more of Newfoundland's commercial enterprises had moved to St. John's. Its citizens were perceptive enough to think that the Opportunities afforded by transatlantic aviation might well put the community on the map again, both through public awareness and eventual commercial activity. A committee from the town met with Kohler and persuaded him to locate the airstrip there in return for community involvement, both with construction participation and financial involvement. <laughs> with his agreement, a non-profit Harbor Grace Airport Trust Company was formed and with some financial assistance from Stinson and considerably more from the Newfoundland government, an airstrip was constructed. It was built by the town's citizens, employing up to 300 men and local reserves. It ended up by being a little short of 4,000 feet or the in length or 1,200 meters. While not a particularly sophisticated facility, Brock and Slee were loud in their praise and were quoted as saying that it would do much uh, to convince the world of the feasibility of using Newfoundland as a base in future transatlantic flights. This uh, prediction was to be amply confirmed over the next few years. The airstrip was completed on the 25th of August of 1927 and the next day, the Pride of Detroit took off to cross the Atlantic. Despite the heavy weather, she eventually made a successful landing at Croydon, England. Brock and Slade continued on their way and reached Tokyo on the 15th of September. Then, ostensibly by, because they were refused navigation facilities by the United States Navy, they decided to call it quits and return to the U.S. by ship. The construction of the Harbor Grace Airfield was almost certainly the most significant event in Newfoundland aviation in the decade and a half after the First World War and proved to be a boon to most of the early transatlantic flyers. Here was a usable facility near a moderate sized community that was 600 miles closer to the nearest point in Britain or Europe. It was not long after Brock and Slee had taken off for, their mobile, uh, for that. Uh, more hopeful transatlantic flyers arrived. Oddly enough, the first ones were among the first, the few Canadian aspirants to transatlantic glory. Both originated in southwestern Ontario, and the aircraft of choice in each case was a similar Stinson Detroiter. The first was sponsored by the Carling O'Keefe Brewery for London, Ontario, which had offered a $25,000 prize for the first aircraft to fly nonstop from that city to London, England. The aircraft was christened the Sir John Carling, and the two airmen were former Ontario Provincial Air Service pilots, Terence Tully and James Metcalf. 
The second aircraft was named Royal Windsor, and uh, in it, Philip Wood, also a former OPAS pilot, and his co-pilot, Tyrone Scheller, planned to fly from Windsor, Ontario to Windsor, England. After some difficulties in the initial portions of the uh, proposed flights, it was realized that the non-stop portion of the stipulation was not really feasible. As a result, Tully and Metcalf decided to commence their transatlantic flight from Harbor Bridge. At 7 a.m. on 7 September 1927, the Sir John Carlin took off and headed out over the Atlantic, never to be seen again. In the meantime, Wood and Schiller, having abandoned the winter to winter idea, decided to cross the Atlantic, leaving from Old Orchard Beach, Maine, in company with a Fokker monoplane, present Old Glory, and sponsored by the American newspaper magnate William, uh, William Randolph Hurt. The Old Glory took off 6 September before the Canadian team were ready to depart. Next morning, an SOS signal was received, but an intensive search failed to locate the aircraft. Five days later, some wreckage were located, but the crew were never found. An hour after the SOS was received, Wood and Schiller decided that it would be prudent to leave from Harbor Grace instead and proceeded there, arriving after Tully and Metcalf's departure. By this time, a great furor had brewed up over the wisdom of these transatlantic flights. Not only had the Sir John Carling and the Old Glory come to grief, but other aircraft had disappeared recently on similar flights over the Pacific or on an east to west Atlantic crossing attempt. In the face of this outcry, and possibly their own reservations, Wood and Shirley continued to conclude that discretion was the better part of valor and the Royal Windsor returned to Canada. To some degree now, it was the ladies who took up the faltering torch of transatlantic crossings. In 1927 and 1928, a surprising number of women made the attempt to be the first of their sex to fly, up, to fly across the Atlantic, usually as passengers, though occasionally as co-pilot. The initial flights were initially universally unsuccessful with all too frequently tragic results. Two attempts were made, in, made by English women the Princess Lowell Stein Wertheim in August 1927, and the shipping heiress Elsie McKay in March 1928. Each left England for a Western Ocean crossing and, come with their pilots, were never seen again. Two American ladies also entered the race. The movie actress and amateur pilot Ruth Elder tried the southern route in October 1927 but was forced to ditch before she reached the Azores, although she and her pilot were rescued. The American reporter and woman's advocate, Frances West Grayson, opted for the shorter route via Newfoundland in the hazardous season of December 1927, and she and her crew disappeared en you know, route to Newfoundland and were never found. There remained two other American ladies in the field, two entirely different personalities and backgrounds. It was a very definite rivalry and ended up in a real showdown in Newfoundland. The first was a, a, Amelia Earhart, who was a highly experienced pilot and had spent most of her, her adult years in aviation. The flight was financed by what seemed to be the inevitable heiress, Amy Guest, who was keen on finding the, on funding the first transatlantic flight by a woman. She had obtained a trimotor Fokker, which she named the Friendship, and hired two male crew members, Wilmer Stoltz and Louis Gordon, to fly the aircraft, and then selected a suit as a suitable woman to fly with them as a passenger, Amelia Earhart. <coughs> On the 4th of June, 1928, the Friendship, now equipped with floats, landed in Trapassi, Newfoundland. Presumably, this location was chosen because of the previous experience of the U.S. Navy NC aircraft in 1919 and of DiPineto that previous year. While they had hoped to make a near immediate takeoff for Europe, bad weather marooned them at Trapassi for two weeks. This delay gave Earhart's rival renewed hopes. She was Mabel Bolt a prominent New York socialite nicknamed the Diamond Queen. 
She had become involved with the millionaire, Charles Levine, who was flying with his pilot, Clarence Chamberlain, had made the transatlantic flight immediately after Lindbergh's. Levine had agreed to loan this ball to Columbia, the Boanca monoplane in which he had made the crossing. Initially, she had expected Wilmer Stokes to be her pilot, and when he had transferred his allegiance to Amelia Earhart, she was highly incensed. However, she soon located as her pilot and mechanic, and the Columbia landed at the Harbor Grace on the 12th of June. However, the high winds that were delaying Earhart and her crew at Trapassi also had the same effect on Harbor Grace. Miss Bowles seemed to have led a fairly active social life while waiting for the weather to improve. The crew at Trapassi, of necessity, never went particularly far from their aircraft, and so at the first opportunity, after several attempts, managed to take off and, with some difficulty, made it as far as the coast of Wales, which gave Amelia Earhart the credit for being the first woman to cry across the Atlantic. Mabel Bowles' enthusiasm for the flight rapidly went. She returned to the U.S. after making a financial donation to the Harbor Grace Airstrip finances. Her interest in aviation soon dissipated, and she plunged once more into the social world. As I think is well known, Amelia Earhart went on from strength to strength. She downplayed her part in the friendship crossing and emphasized that she was a little more than a passenger. Now, to jump our narrative thread by the head by several years, in 1932 she determined to make the crossing on her own, and in May of that year arrived in Harbor Grace with her own Lockheed Vega monoplane. <coughs> she intended to fly to Paris to mark the first fifth anniversary of Lindbergh's crossing, and duly departed on the 20th of May. She experienced considerable trouble with her aircraft, and due to its deterioration, abandoned the attempt to fly to Paris and landed instead in Northern Ireland. Unlike many of the other ocean crossers, she made no claim as to her flight's importance, importance to aviation progress, but did emphasize that it demonstrated that a woman could do anything that a man could. Now, despite the near Holocaust of failed attempts in 1927, the new year of 1928 saw no lack of adventures. Early off the mark were two Germans, von Hunnefeld, a wealthy aristocrat, and Kohl, Lufthansa's chief pilot. In their youngers W-33, the Bremen, they had determined to try the difficult east-to-west crossing. They got as far as Dublin, Ireland, where they waited for 17 days for suitable weather, during which period they were joined by an Irish Air Force officer, James Fitzmaurice. At last, conditions seemed suitable, and on the 12th of April, 1928, they took off with their destination, New York. The entire trip was marked by stormy and foggy weather, and eventually they emerged over the, over the Labrador coast. They flew down the coast, and fuel shortage caused them to make an emergency landing on Greenlee Island, a mile or so on the Quebec side of the Canada-Newfoundland border. They were given up for lost for several days, but were eventually heard from and picked up, though their aircraft was irreparable. <coughs> this marked the first semi-successful East-West Atlantic flight. The publicity and praise given Lindbergh after his successful 1927 flight was well deserved. However, some of the exaggerated publicity may have had an unfortunate effect on some individuals. Some of the nicknames accorded to Lindbergh were Lucky Lindy and The Flying Fool. <coughs> this gave an entirely false impression. Lindbergh had no more than his fair share of luck, and his success was based on his being a highly experienced aviator who meticulously prepared for the flight in a specially constructed aircraft. Whether this can be held directly responsible or no, some transatlantic aspirants turned up over the next couple of years in Harbor Grace, who can, at the best, be designated as idiots or crazies. The first of these was the retired Royal Navy commander, H.C. <coughs> MacDonald, who possessed a little gypsy mouth combined with negligible flying experience. He had the one hour night flying time. He took off on 7 October 1928, 
was spotted by a ship 700 miles off the coast of Newfoundland and then disappeared forever. Next was an American rancher from Montana, Urban Dykeman, who arrived on 19th October 1929 in a barreling monoplane, had it christened the Golden Hind after the ship of his supposed ancestor, Sir Francis Drake, and after spending, spreading various stories about his intentions, took off on a transatlantic flight and was never seen again. There was another attempt which fortunately did not end in tragedy. Next year, 1930, <coughs> an experienced former RAF pilot, C.S. Wynne Aiton, arrived in St. John's with a crated push moth. He had originally intended a westward flight from Ireland, but had thought better of the idea and determined to fly east from Newfoundland. He had converted his aircraft into what was practically close to being a flying gas tank, and when, on 6 July, he took off from Leicester Field of St. John's for his intended starting point in Harbour Grace, the aircraft stalled on takeoff, crashed, and burned. Winnaton was badly burned but survived, which is, quite probably, something he would have not have done if he had attempted to make a flight alone in his light aircraft. Probably the most experienced uh, aviator to visit Harbour Grace in the 1930s was Charles Kingsford Smith, an extremely well-known Australian aviator uh, with an extensive endurance flight including one across the Pacific already to his credit. His Newfoundland visit was at the end of the transatlantic leg of around the world. His Fulker monoplane, the Southern Cross, had left California in May 1930 and had then flown westward in stages until he reached Ireland. He remained there for three weeks waiting for favorable weather until on 23 June 1930, he and his three crewmen left across the Atlantic. Their destination was the U.S., but the combination of bad weather and resulting fatigue and fuel consumption found them lost off the coast of Newfoundland. Eventually, they came through a break in the cloud and landed at Harbor Grace. Although this was not their intended destination, it did qualify as the first aircraft across the Atlantic in that direction to arrive safely. They eventually left Newfoundland and reached the United States where they were given an extremely enthusiastic welcome. Now that pioneering flights were becoming old hat, record setting became the uh, next phase. For example, it, one example is the American impresario John Mears, who had set several records for circling the globe over the previous couple of decades, albeit none solely by aircraft. His final attempt was in 1930 when, with uh, pilot Henry Brown, he left New York in the Lockheed Bay which he had christened City of New York on the 2nd of August, 1930. They reached Harbor Grace without difficulty and early next morning took off to cross the Atlantic. Before they got airborne, one of the aircraft wheels hit a rock, causing it to swerve off the runway and be severely damaged. This accident apparently cured mirrors of its circumnavigation fixation. Another 1930 flight was considerably more successful. The hero was Errol Boyd, a Canadian ex-RNAS pilot who had a very post-war uh, career as a songwriter and a charter and air model pilot. He had, he had acquired the Balanca monoplane, Columbia, which had not only made a previous Atlantic crossing, but had also turned up in Harbor Grace two years earlier with Mabel Bull. He had hoped to obtain Canadian financial support, but instead ran into legal problems in Montreal, finally arriving in Harbor Grace on the 23rd of September. Now, apparently, Boyd had renamed the aircraft the Maple Leaf, but oddly enough, no photograph of the aircraft during this period shows it's carrying this name. Furthermore, all of the <coughs> publicity, the newspaper accounts and so forth still refer to it as the Columbia, so whether the Maple Leaf cognomen was a retroactive thing added after the flight, I can't be telling you. Not daunted by the lateness of the season, after waiting several weeks for favorable weather, 
Boyd and his uh, navigator, Harry Connors, took off on the 9th of October and finally, when almost out of fuel, landed on a beach in the Scilly Islands just off the, west, uh, the southwest tip of Britain. The flight was still distinctive for a number of reasons. It was the first to make a successful crossing for late in the year. Boyd was the first Canadian to make such a flight, while the aircraft was the first to have made two separate crossings of the Atlantic. Along with the spirit of the St. Louis, Columbia, and the Southern Cross, one of the most famous aircraft of the period was a Lockheed Vega monoplane called the Winnie May. You could hardly be expected that this aircraft would not appear sometime in Harbor Grace, in fact, at the beginning of its career. Its pilot, Wiley Post, along with his navigator Howard Daffy, intended only to fly around the world, not only to fly around the world, but to set a record in doing so by beating the 1929 time of the uh, German original Graf Zeppelin, which had done it in 21 days. Arriving at Harbor Grace on 24 June 1931, Post and Gatti refueled and departed eastward only four hours later. After an adventurous crossing and an equally adventurous circumnavigation, they arrived back in New York in eight days and 16 hours from the departure. Later, Wally Post and the Winnie May had other feats to their credit, but they never again stopped in Newfoundland. Simultaneously with the Winnie May was the first of a series of flyers which, uh, who can only be described as nationalists or patriots. These men were attempting to be the first to fly from North America to some specific point in Europe for the first time, either for the publicity or to make some kind of uh, political uh, point. The first of these actually arrived in Harbor Bridge two days before the Winnie May. It took off at approximately the same time, though it could not make the same speed. This was a Balanca flown by two ex expatriate Danes, Horace and Hilly. It was named the Liberty after the town of Liberty, New York, with the intention of being the first aircraft to fly from North America to Denmark. Fortunately for the two men, Horace had made himself an expert in bad weather navigation, which did enable them to reach Europe, albeit in such an exhausted state that they had to put down in Germany, flying on to Copenhagen the next day. The next attempt was even more blatantly nationalistic. Hungary, as a result of the dissection of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had lost a large percentage of what it considered was its territory. Thus, the Lockheed Sirius that was uh, used by two Hungarian-American flyers in an attempt to fly from North America to Hungary was christened Justice for Hungary. The flight was not only intended to call attention to Hungary's misfortune, but also to claim a monetary prize offered by the British newspaper magnate Lord Rothermere for the first transatlantic flight to reach Budapest. The aircraft left Harbour Bridge on the 15th of July, 1930, and despite a successful crossing, as seemed to be inevitably the case, found themselves short of fuel before reaching their goal. In actual fact, they made it to 32 kilometers short of Budapest before they were forced to land. And despite this shortfall, they were awarded the cash. Some fascinating complications resulted at their arrival, including various challenges and acceptances of duel, all of which is beyond the scope of this talk, which is a pity. Soon after this, though, the forces of the Depression struck, and sponsors for this type of aviation endeavor was few and far between, particularly for record flights. However, in 1932, a Norwegian newspaper offered a financial reward for the flight, first flight from North America to Oslo. This attracted uh, uh, competitors. Fortunately, I don't need to describe their efforts in detail, as the story was well covered by Elizabeth's article on to Oslo in a recent CAH journal. In essence, the big Balanca K, energetic, and its crew were forced to ditch into Sanchu Bay before reaching Harbor Grace. The Stinson Detroiter, Green Mountain Boy, made it to Harbor Grace after a forced landing on the north coast of Newfoundland. It took off on the 24th of August, 1932, for Oslo, 
and we'll never see it again. The last country to be the target of an individual transatlantic crossing was Poland. The two Abramovich brothers of Brooklyn, USA, determined to make the flight from the U.S. to Warsaw. They earned their pilot's license and uh, hired the Danish pilot Holger Horvitz, who had made the flight to Copenhagen, and purchased his Balanta, the Liberty, which they renamed White Eagle. They took off from Harbor Grace on the 8th of August, 1933, but swerved off the airstrip and crashed into the adjoining bush. They were not seriously injured, but their aircraft was damaged. They returned to New York where the aircraft was repaired and where the brothers had their navigation, bad weather skills enhanced by Horace. They returned to Harbor Grace the next year with a repaired Belanca, which was now christened Warsaw, presumably to change the luck. The aircraft took off on the 29th of June, 1934, with one of the Abramovich boys on board. They reached Europe, but they had to make four standards in France and Germany and elsewhere in Poland before they reached Warsaw, where before they became celebrities. They re returned to the U.S., where they were eventually thrown into jail for bootlegging and faded from the aviation scene. Now, one transatlantic event that did touch Newfoundland twice and can definitely be described as nationalistic was the visit of 24 Italian Sefoya Marchese 55 flying boats in a flotilla led by high-ranking fascist and associate of Mussolini, Italo Balbo. Having successfully made a flight to South America with 12 of these aircraft two years earlier, Balbo set out for North America with his goal, the Chicago World Fair. Leaving Italy on the 30th of June, 1933, the flotilla flew via Amsterdam with one of where one of the original 25 aircraft was damaged beyond repair to Ireland, Iceland, and then to Cartwright in Labrador. Having spent a festive evening in the tiny community, the Italian flotilla went on by Shediac, New Brunswick, and Montreal, finally reaching Chicago. After a great deal of celebration, etc., etc., Balbo and his flotilla left New York on the 25th of July and ended up at Shoal Harbor, near Clarenville, in Kennedy Bay, Newfoundland. He had expected to uh, depart within five days of his arrival, but like many aviators before him found, he had to wait for a couple of weeks because of unsuitable weather. During this time, he visited St. John's, where a good time was had by all. Finally, on the 8th of August, the hotel got off and headed for the Azores, with him made, which they made just in the nick of time, although one of the aircraft crashed on landing. The remaining 23 aircraft made it back to Italy with the enthusiasm was fantastic. Since that event is frequently denigrated as being an advertisement for Italian fascism, which indeed it was. However, this should not blind us to the fantastic feat that it actually was. Another large-scale aviation endeavor had already reached Newfoundland, this time embodied in a single aircraft, the monstrous Dornier DOX. This 12-engine monoplane flying boat with a three-deck interior within its hull had been launched in 1929. While it certainly had its merits, its lack of power, some of the time it was practically a ground attack vehicle, ground effect vehicle, and uh, massive fuel consumption and general unreliability meant that the concept was eventually abandoned, and the Zeppelin airships became mainstays of German long-range air travel. Before this, however, after making a successful South Atlantic crossing in 1932, after moving to the North Atlantic, it visited Holyrood, Newfoundland. It was soon retired, but the aircrafts, Graf Zeppelin and Hamburg, frequently were observed from Newfoundland during their many Atlantic crossings. Now, an often overlooked aspect of Newfoundland's interest in the commercial possibilities of transatlantic aviation was the sale of postage stamps, both for postal purposes and for philatelists, and equally important, stamp dealers. Newfoundland, even in the 19th century, was remarkably ahead of its time in producing stamps that would have appeal for collectors. 
not solely for them, of course, all Newfoundland postage stamps were primarily intended for postal purposes. However, the advent of Atlantic flying added a new dimension, and for the great majority of the flights, a special issue of postage stamps, usually involving an overprinted the existing issue, was produced. These proved to be in great demand and also became an excellent source of revenue to the continually cash-strapped government. For example, for the DOX, hundreds of people lined up at the General Post Office to buy stamps to be mailed on the next stage of the aircraft flight. <coughs> also, ordinary Newfoundland airmail stamps were also in demand <coughs> by dealers and collectors. Now, to jump the gun a little bit, but still remaining in the field of postage stamps, this situation led to one of the most bizarre episodes of Newfoundland's association with transoceanic aviation. In late 1931, a group of Minneapolis businessmen decided to make a preemptive strike on the transatlantic airmail contract with the U.S. government by a clandestine scheme to obtain air rights over Newfoundland. The idea was to purchase a Sikorsky flying boat or more to undertake a northern route across the Atlantic and to finance the purchase of this or these aircraft by the sale of postage stamps. The Newfoundland government conditionally agreed and 400,000 of these stamps, the so-called Waisata issue, was printed in Minneapolis. The idea being that the company would take 300,000 well, the Newfoundland Post Office would take 100,000. Sales were disappointing. The whole scheme rapidly imploded, and the stamps never became an official issue of Newfoundland. While a surprising percentage of these early transatlantic flyers claimed that they were paving the way for commercial aviation, this was rarely taken seriously. However, major aviation interests in Europe, and in particular Britain and the United States, were becoming increasingly inconvinced of practicality. In essence, there were three choices as to the route to follow. There was the southern one via the Azores, which had the, the advantage of better flying conditions, but the disadvantage of a much longer distance. There was a direct route from North America to Britain or Europe, which was considerably shorter if a Newfoundland facility was involved. And finally, a northern route via Greenland and Iceland, which would also involve Newfoundland and Labrador. This had the advantage of cutting down the long overwater flights but had the obvious disadvantage of much more severe weather and even worse flying conditions, particularly in the winter. Newfoundland's uh, significance in the northern route had been emphasized by the settlement of the Labrador boundary dispute between Newfoundland and Canada in Newfoundland's favor. This meant, in effect, that if a straight line was drawn between Cape Chidley and Labrador and Cape Race and Newfoundland, Newfoundland possessed a 850 airline truck to the Atlantic. The number of exploratory flights towards establishing a northern transatlantic route were made, although time now prohibits anything but a cursory member of the field. So both in 1913 and 1932, a Dornier Val, flown by Wolfgang von Gronau and his crew, successfully flew via Iceland, Greenland, and Kirkwood, Labrador to the U.S on the latter occasion continuing around the world. His experiences left von Grauneau completely disenchanted with the northern route. On the other hand, Charles Lindbergh and his wife, who had been uh, hired as technical experts, experts by Pan American Airways, visited St. John's in July 1933 in a Lockheed Sirius seaplane at the beginning of a survey to determine possible landing sites in Newfoundland, Labrador, Greenland, and Iceland. They conducted a very comprehensive Arctic survey. The result of this, however, was a recommendation that this northern route would be impractical for a large part of the year for the water-based aircraft that were initially contemplated, 
for a transatlantic commercial service. In the meantime, things had definitely been progressing on the international front. Both Britain and the United States had determined on their chosen instrument for international flying, Imperial Airways and Pan American Airways. British uh, efforts had been inhibited by the decision to go for airships in the long range air travel. However, despite the R100's successful flight to Canada, the disastrous loss of the R101 in early 1931 effectively knocked that scheme on the head and left no other course but to rely on aircraft. As they moved into the 1930s, each of these airlines expanded their routes and networks. Pan American ended up with the longest international network in the world with its routes in the Caribbean, Central and South America, while Imperial Airways steadily moved through the empire as far as South, South Africa and Australia. Obviously, the last frontier for each of these airlines was the Atlantic. And equally obviously, flying and landing rights in Newfoundland would be a real necessity. Pan American realized that these rights would have to be obtained from Newfoundland and set out to obtain them. Britain, on the other hand, initially expected that Newfoundland would fall into line as a loyal little soldier of the Empire and a willing participant in the uh, all red route. Newfoundland took seriously the statements of the Imperial Conference of 1926 and the Statute of Westminster of 1931, each of which gave the Dominions the right to make their own international decisions. Furthermore, as the icy grip of the Great Depression tightened on Newfoundland, the country became increasingly desperate for money. With its resource-based economy badly crippled by the Depression and the heavy weight of its debt, the Dominion was reaching the stage which, when it would do almost anything for money, including making a deal with the Americans. Indeed, it was not long before negotiations had commenced, although the Americans had a somewhat ambivalent view of the Newfoundland government. The Pan American history referred to the negotiations as akin to dealing with the Latin American government. Time does not permit an intensive review of the next couple of years. However, from the Newfoundland point of view, they were chaotic. In early 1932, a mob of the unemployed invaded the Newfoundland House of Assembly, forcing the Prime Minister to fly for his life. In a subsequent election, his Liberal Party was all but annihilated, leaving the government dominated by the conservative financial establishment, who were none too enamored of the prospect of playing an enhanced international role. By then, finances were desperate, and after strong British and Canadian hints to say nothing of pressure, a Royal Commission of British and Canadian experts was empowered to investigate Newfoundland's financial situation. There is little doubt that, despite a certain degree of personal integrity, and minimal degree, I would say, the commissioners knew what they had to report, and they recommended that Newfoundland abrogate its independence for a period of time with government being entrusted to a joint British Newfoundland unelected commission. Newfoundland was returned to Dominion status once it had become self supported Ha! It's interesting to note that the chairman of the Royal Commission, the Canadian-born banker, Lord Amory, stated that the Newfoundlanders were not really capable of self-government because they had no leisure class. <laughs> Apparently, they could not govern themselves because they were too busy working. The Newfoundland government duly voted itself out of existence. There is no doubt in my mind, that, and that of many other historians, that the whole thing was a setup to take Newfoundland, the empire's loose cannon, out of play and out of the hands of the Americans. After all, everybody else would get the bailouts, the Australians from Britain, Britain simply reneged on the immediate uh, payment of its debts. Alberta and I believe other Western Canadian provinces went back or were bailed out by the Dominion government without anybody suggesting they revert to being territories. Anyway, enough. 
that the Americans were extremely chagrined at the thought that they had a deal with Newfoundland and, as they almost did. However, they kept trying and at least had a gentleman's agreement with Britain that Pan Am and Imperial would be partners with short uh, and uh, of a sort and would not start services without informing and cooperating with the other. Canada also came into the picture and it's interesting that the Pan Am representative <coughs> negotiating in Ottawa with Canadian Postal Authorities in 1934 was found dead outside his Ottawa hotel window. Various theories were advanced as to the cause of this fatal fall, temporary dizziness and weakness, suicide, or something else. Nobody had the extremely bad taste to suggest that negotiation with Canadian bureaucrats could make a man suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> now, time is obviously hurtling by, so I'll have to cover what's left of my paper in an extremely cursory manner. The number of adventurers steadily diminished while those that had, on the surface, a more practical interest continued. One of the latter in 1936 was a faulty single engine airliner called Lady Peace. The object of his flight was to make a rapid return flight from the U.S. to the U.K. and back again in the minimum time. On the way back, they got in lost over Newfoundland and made a forced landing at Rosebury Harbor. An Eastern Airlines DC-2 was sent to rescue them and, after landing it by mistake at Musgrave Town, recognized their mistake, went to Musgrave Harbor, organized an improvised runway for the Volte, where they made it to the Harbor Grace and returned. The last transatlantic aircraft to use Harbor Grace was a Balanca flash high-speed monoplane piloted by the well-known record setter, Jimmy Mollison, was frantically setting records to score off his equally famous wife, Amy Johnson, with whom he was now on bad terms. He named it the Dorothy after an actress with whom he was currently having an affair. He stayed in Harbor Grace for one day and then was on his way. I am going to have to skim the rest of the subject. Let it be said that an exclusive transatlantic agreement between Britain and the U.S later involved in the Irish Free State and even Canada was drawn up in 1936. This involved construction of landing facilities in Newfoundland, and the Newfoundland Commission of Government was involved in selection and construction of these sites at Gander and at Botwood, respectively. Botwood would be, would be for the flying boats, while the airfield at Gander would be for the land planes that had yet to be developed. In ignorance of their possible size, the runways at Gander were absolutely immense. About the only benefit the Newfoundland got from those sites was the employment provided by their construction. Both airlines undertook joint experimental flights to Botwood in 1937. Pan Am used a Sikorsky S-42B, while Imperial used a short Empire class flying boat called the Caledonia. Imperial was a disadvantage because its larger flying boats were designed to fly within the British Empire, which had sufficient facilities to permit short flight lines. To make the trip non-stop, the Caledonia had been stripped of everything but essential equipment. As a result, Imperial, through necessities, had to come up with something that would allow at least to fly mail across the Atlantic. After a bizarre experiment flying involving a piggyback pair of aircraft, it fell back on in-flight refueling. A pair of handy page Harrow flying tankers was stationed at Gander for this purpose. Imperial never really got its successful passenger services established before the war. However, Pan Am, which had upgraded from the Sikorsky to the Boeing 314, commenced operations in the summer of 1939. And here my story ends. As we all know, it was during the war that Newfoundland really came of age as far as large-scale aviation was concerned. As with its loss of independence, its value in this regard was a very definite factor in, this, in instigating the whole sordid business of confederation. <coughs> I will certainly not go into this subject, or otherwise my Newfoundland nationalism will hurt to the surface, and will be exposed to a rant rather than a historical dissertation. So, I thank you.